Alrighty, folks, today I am here for a special treat. I bring you a bass player and music director for the stars. He has performed with 50 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees and in 12 Broadway shows. He's the music director for Sam Moore of Sam and Dave fame, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, the Shirelles, performed with Sting, Elvis Costello, The Temptations, Solomon Burke, Benny King, Percy Sledge, Eddie Floyd, Rufus and Carla Thomas, Bo Diddley, Buster Poindexter, the Uptown Horns, I'm trying to get my breath, Paul Rogers, Winona Judd, and David Foster, just to name a few. He's in the process of putting out an in-depth autobiographical, is that how you say that autobiographical, folks? Autobiographical. I don't know. You know me and my loose lips. But it's a memoir. It's entitled, Am I Famous Yet? It's a satirical, occasionally snarky account of the dichotomy of an arena and Broadway playing rock star juxtaposed to a two-man combo in the hallway of a local taco joint, not to mention the glamour and glitz of playing the ultimate catering hall bar mitzvah. He chronicles the life of a working musician who has met, worked closely with, and gotten to know renowned rock stars. He's particularly become a rock star himself without all the annoying trappings of actual notoriety or fortune. He gives the observer the opportunity to follow this side man's hilarious, heartbreaking search for fame, financial stability, and the ever-elusive quest for emotional peace of mind. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and all-around great guy, I bring you Ivan Bodley. Welcome to the show, my friend. Donnie, thanks so much for having me. I'm out of breath just listening to you say all that crap. Holy cow, that is the longest introduction I think I've ever done, and you deserve every minute, and I think I cut out about 50 different things that you've done on top of that. Just couldn't get the breath in there. That's just the highlight reel, buddy. Just the highlight reel. It's all good. Wow, wow, wow. So, you know, let's just dig straight in. People are going to want to know, how did it all start for you? As a young child, musician, you were always going to be? Tell me. No, I didn't pick up a bass till I was a senior in high school. I had no idea that that was going to be my career path. In fact, when I first went to college, I went to study biomedical engineering. I had no idea that I was going to be a musician. And then I graduated. I went into the music business of the publicist for Epic Records. And I decided that's the business is about business, not about music. So I quit that and then went back to music school. And then I've been doing that ever since. But it took me, yeah, I was a little later in life before I figured out that that's exactly what I wanted to do. That's actually amazing. So uh, how old would you say we're talking in your late teens, early 20s? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the first bass lesson I ever took, I was 17 years old. And I didn't get to uh, Berkeley College of Music until I was 25, 26, I think, you know, so it's yeah, it was a it was a late decision. It was a, a complete career change from the whole music business thing, which I did initially. Wow. And did you start out at the beginning like all the regular garage band kids having your bands and meeting different people and networking? And Of course, of course. You know, doing cover songs. We played at the, in the high school gymnasium doing Police, Rolling Stones and uh, Rush covers, you know, like everybody. We started that way. Who would have thought back in high school you're doing Police covers that you one day would work with Sting? Could you imagine? I, no. I could not imagine, and believe me, that was one of the, the craziest things that ever happened. It's sort of like, because you, when you know, when you're coming up, you have these idols, the people that you, you uh, look up to your whole life, and then to eventually get to play with those people, is, it's, a, it's a surreal experience. It really is. I can only imagine what that would feel like, and that takes me right to my next question. You've done a multitude of types of gigs. You've done arena playing, a Broadway, you've been on television shows. You've traveled the world. You've done a lot of, let's say, for someone for the very first time doing these type of gigs would be just like mind-blowing. What I want to know, if you could think back, it's going to be interesting, which was the first type of gig on any of those levels that you did that scared you the most for the first time? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Like, I don't get the stage fright too badly because I, I do it all the time. I'm on stage constantly. So, like, you, you kind of learn to mitigate that. But uh, the first the, time, though, back in the day, first time back in the day, I, you know, I think probably the first sort of biggish time gig I ever did was I got hired as in a pickup band to back up Bo Diddley 
uh, in the road on the road in New Orleans, and it was sort of like I was definitely out of my depth. It was the first thing that I'd ever done, which was sort of like name recognition professional. This is even before he was in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know. So like I, I knew enough to sort of play a twelve bar blues on my bass, but that was about it. So I really got lucky. Uh, and but again, the stage fright didn't get me too bad. It was sort of like I, I kind of knew it was sort of one foot in front of the other. So I kind of knew what I was supposed to be doing. And it was a great situation. So it actually worked out. But uh, sure. Yeah. I've been, so I've both been Italy, both Italy. Oh, Wow. Yeah, both, yeah. I got to see him. I'm lucky one time. It was great. Great show at a, at a college out on Long Island, New York. But uh, just to say like, you know, like the very first time you went from bar mitzvahs and weddings to playing arenas. I mean, look yeah. at that, that difference there. This is absolutely insane. It, it is insane. And I tell you what, the thing is, uh, you know, no matter how much of a, a rock star type gig you do, the next week you're going to be at the Lipschitz Bar Mitzvah in Piscataway. That's just the nature of the... <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that so much. Is that what made you want to, because we're going to get into that soon, get into this whole uh, autobiographical memoir that you're putting out, your video uh, log, if you would, your blog? I, I think so. You know, uh, it, it's the kind of thing I've always had road stories and, and uh, gig nightmare stories that I've always liked to tell people just sitting around the dinner table on a break. And I've had a bunch of people say, you know, you should write a book. You know, you, know, you should write a book. And I'm like, maybe I'll write a book, you know. And I started about four years ago to sort of put the, some of the stories together and it, it turned into a book. So wow. now, and now what, what you're seeing now is I'm serializing the chapters on YouTube. I'm releasing one chapter a week. Uh, there's 42 of them written so far, and uh, we'll see if it actually, well, eventually it'll, it'll be self-published. It'll be something that you can, you can actually get on Kindle or, or in, in hard copy, but right now it's, uh, it's video only. I can't wait to check that out. It's going to be awesome. And would you say, I think, I mean, I, I call you, uh, I've known you a while, truth be told, one of the hardest working musicians in show business. What would be like in a typical of your busy, right now COVID, nobody's doing anything. But at your busiest, at the height, I know you must keep track. I know you keep records of things you've done. What would you say? How many times have you gigged in a year? I yeah, I think my best year was. I, I do have uh, a, a solid statistics on all of this. I think my best year so far was about 350 gigs in a year. 350 gigs think, in a year. Yeah, I think that's right. I average my average year is about 240 gigs a year. Average. Wow, and it's not unlike uh, unlike you to jump on a plane at a moment's notice and be in a different country, be in a different state. Yeah, I got a bag packed by the door at all times, and I always I have for twenty five years. I've been that way. Yeah. So you've been all over all over the world. Twenty nine countries, and I think forty forty six states or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I've been around. And uh, any exotic places that you play that stand out that the viewers would like to hear about? That's really memorable to you that's cool super cool yeah i mean well the things that i've enjoyed the most there are certain gigs that i've had that spent multiple trips to the same location so like there was a rock orchestra thing that i was doing that we went to turkey probably seven or eight times all wow. over turkey we get to know people we get to see the how people live we get to see their houses we get to eat their food you know that was really really engaging and wonderful uh, similarly with Sam Moore, we would travel to the Blue Note in Tokyo. We've probably been there seven, eight times over the years. You know, so you, you, you get to see the country, you see the people, see the culture. It's really invaluable. Um, and then there was another songwriter tour I used to do. We were, we were in Italy probably half a dozen, a dozen times, you know, and just traveling the width and breadth of the country. You know, those types of gigs have been the most interesting, I think. I mean, that's beautiful. Not only do you get to do the craft that you love to do, you, if you like, you get to take in scenery, you get to experience people and culture, you get to travel on. It kind of has its perks, I would say. It does have its perks. It's exhausting, but, you know, if you can stop and smell the roses a little bit, it can be really wonderful, too. It's, you just hit the nail on the head with my life. I talk about it's all about perspective. It's how you look at things. Sure. And the way you, if you look at things, uh, you know, um, it, it just can make the world of things. It could be horrible. It could be great. Uh, it's really your perspective. You really create your own reality. And I think well, you're, you get to do what you love to do. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a beautiful thing. 
you're the you're the poster child for that too because you've been dealt some cards that a lot of people haven't been dealt and you've made it into sunshine and roses man it's amazing what you do well thank you i got a couple of aces somewhere down in the hole i like to hold them and you know kenny rogers isn't with us but we all have done a lot of bar mitzvahs so we've we've, we've yeah. sang that song enough times yes and you've yes. done a lot of russian weddings i have to throw that out there a oh, lot yeah. of russian weddings yeah no collusion i'm just kidding no. but it's all good it's all good I um, want to ask you a question. This is interesting. We have a lot of youngsters that are out there that watch the show, and but I want to know what advice can you give young aspiring musicians? That's what I'd like to know from someone that's just about done it all. Well, you know, it depends on what you want to do. You know, like I got some really good advice early on, sort of uh, uh, helping me to separate out the fact whether you want to do this as for a living or if you want to do this for like a professional hobby, or if you want to do this for like an artistic pursuit, these are different levels of engagement, you know? So you have to sort of figure out what's really valuable to you and, and, and how much time and energy you have to devote to your instrument and your craft, you know? And I, and I try to approach it sort of on, on every different level, you know, like music is my hobby as well as my source of, of living and income. Uh, and then when I, sort of realized that I was kind of done with the music business when I quit the, my record company job, you know, I realized, all right, if I'm going to do this now, like as a musician, a full time musician, I really going to have to get my act together, which meant I went back to school. I went back to college. I already had a college degree. I went back to college, took out loans, paid for it myself, paid off my own college loans just to learn the specific skills, and I, I happen to chose Berkeley College of Music, there are plenty of other places to study. But you know, if you wanted to take it to that level, which I knew I did, or I felt I didn't have any choice, really, it was the only thing I wanted to do. I knew I had to, to accumulate those skills to give myself even a shot at it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you're saying go to school, really think about what you want to do, and then take in what you need to do to, to learn that craft and learn it well. I'll try to set it if you would, get out as much as you could. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be a school. It doesn't have to be matriculation, you know, formally like that. I studied with a guy privately when I lived in London who was, he happened to be a Berkeley graduate. I just took private lessons from him for like 50 pounds a week or whatever it cost me. And he taught me the entire Berkeley harmony system in six months. Wow. When I school, when I got to Berkeley, they, you take a, a, a placement exam. And they placed me out of all the harmony requirements because I already learned them all privately. So you don't have to do it at college. You can do it, you know, with a private teacher. You can be an autodidact. You can study yourself, you know, but you've got to have to work at it. though. If you really want to do it, you really have to dedicate some time. And you should love doing it because, you know, if you love it that much, it won't feel like, you know, a burden. I love the way you just put that. I think that's great yeah. advice for everybody. Listen, Ivan, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show. And I'll tell you, over the years in the past, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Every time I got to share the stage with you, I enjoyed it immensely. And I can't, th I can't think of a nicer person that I know in the business. Donnie, likewise, it's been my pleasure. Always, you're, you're always a, a ray of sunshine to work with. You always uh, have great energy in person and on stage. I've always enjoyed being around you. Thank you so very much. We're going to throw to a commercial. And when we come back, guys, we've put together uh, a couple of beautiful uh, video snippets. We get to see a very snarky uh, little uh, video vlog, if you would, that I just could not stop. It would just drag me right in. I think you're going to love it. And then a real fun song. If you got the kids out there, bring them in. They're going to love this tune. And uh, again, Ivan, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And I can't wait to see you, my friend, once COVID's over. Thank you, Donnie. Looking forward to it, buddy. All right. Take care. Right on. This is Motorcycle Mike, the personal injury lawyer. I've been riding motorcycles my entire adult life. 
During the course of my 30-year career as a lawyer, I've also represented countless injured motorcyclists. If you are one of them, I can be of assistance to you. Go to my website, please, MotorcycleMikeESQ.com. I'll always be there for you. I'm on your side when you ride. Hi, I'm Robin Eve. And I'm Donnie Vapor, and together we bring you Good Talk on the Strong Island TV Network. We love being able to bring quality content to you every single Sunday, and we look forward to doing that for a long time to come. We are currently looking for sponsors and advertisers for our show. If you have a product or service that you're looking to promote, do you have new music that's available? What would you like to have a good talk with our viewers about? Email us goodtalktvshow at gmail.com. We have all different types of packages available to help you get the word out about whatever it is that you're promoting. Join the Good Talk TV and Strong Island Television family and email us today. Looking forward to working with you. Sookie, 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 take a look at that cookie now. Ah, sookie, 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 take a look at that cookie now. Ah, sookie, 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 take a look at that cookie now.
Welcome back to Am I Famous Yet? Memoir of a Working Class Rock Star. This is called uh, Chapter 12, What is a Rock Star? Rock Star is a term that gets thrown around too casually these days in my opinion. It's now possi possible to be a so-called rock star businessman or rock star plumber while there is certainly eminent dignity in being a plumber, being branded the rock star version of any particular vocation is not the same thing as being an actual rock star. But what is a rock star? At its core, rock stardom implies fame and fortune acquired by a singer or musician through the medium of popular music. Beyond these basic assumptions are also implications of celebrity and ad adoration gained from talent, creativity, panache, artistry, and fashion sense. Rock stardom is acquired and maintained through repeated appearance on radio, television, movies, music videos, world tours, newspapers, magazines, blogs, and social media. Along with all of this comes groupies, sex, drugs, trashed hotel rooms, and never-ending world tours on luxury buses and private planes. Let us not also forget the stereotypical long hair and bad boy repu reputation. By all of these qualifications, it turns out that I am an actual rock star. Except for the pesky fame and fortune part. I have toured some of the world's most famous concert stages, appeared in all manner and nature of mass media, received adoration from rabid fans, and been paid large sums of money for my work. I should probably qualify all of that a bit. I have indeed done all of those things, but in limited quantities and at separate times. For instance, I've had one or two gigs in my life that paid me $2,000 or more in a single night. If you have 200 such gigs a year, for instance, you could make $400,000 in that year, which is a lot of money. Is it rock star money? It's not cliche rock star money, though I do know more than a few actual rock stars and Hall of Famers who would be thrilled with this level of income, especially over time. Like I said, this level of compensation has only graced me a small handful of times. Each time the pay for the single night of work involved weeks of musical transcriptions, writing charts, practice, and preparation. Add to this the hours and hours of often international travel to the venue, days of rehearsal, and about 90 minutes on a concert stage at the end of it all. Occasionally, I try to work out an average hourly wage based on the amount of time I put on, on any given gig. Even discounting the travel time, it turns out that I am working Jeep. The bass player in the old National Lampoon Mr. Rogers sketch was right all along. There are some gigs where afterwards there is a meet and greet or a stage door scene. Fans will be waiting for the performers to exit the building to sign autographs and take pictures. I've been photographed and have signed programs and playbills countless times. It makes me smile every time it happens, not only because it's fun to have the attention, but especially because I know that once I walk about 100 yards from the theater, I will have sunk back into a total obscurity again. I'm only a rock star from the stage door to the corner of 44th Street and 8th Avenue. Once I turn that corner, I'm back to being just another schmo on the subway train back to Brooklyn. TV, movies, radio, video, newspapers, magazines, social media, yep, been there and done them all to one extent or another. Have you heard of me? Has your grandmother heard of me? Probably not. Sex and drugs? More drugs than sex get offered. I always turn them down, not being a user. Trashed hotel rooms? Well, one time I stole a particularly cool Do Not Disturb sign from a boutique ho hotel that said, Leave me alone. They ended up charging my credit card uh, $10 for it. So what does that make me? I guess I'm more of a working class rock star. An hourly wage earner humping my own gear and slogging all over creation to try to earn a peso. Instead of coveralls with my name on a patch over the left breast, I often wear a bargain tuxedo made overseas by child slave labor to be allowed to amuse the rich folk for short periods of time. Occasionally I stand next to an actual rock star for an hour, making music with him or her, listening to the roar of tens of thousands of fans. There are, uh, there are certainly moments when rock stars and I breathe the same rarefied air and eat at the same buffet in the backstage hostility suite. Mostly, I spend time entertaining drunks in bars or playing four-hour functions like the Lipschitz Bar Mitzvah in Piscataway, New Jersey. This inv inevitably involves being yelled at by maitre d's with cheap toupees who view me as less qualified to be in their catering halls than their own dishwashers. Then there are the irate drunken bridesmaids and groomsmen who belligerently scream at us after the end of the contracted four hours. 
After spending all of that time miserably playing cover songs in a tux, they howl, one more song, one more song. You see, they treat us like rock stars. After passively ignoring us or actively scorning us for the first three hours of the function, they imagine that they can somehow appeal to our vanity by complimenting our musicianship, however slurred their verbal delivery may be by that time of the evening. Since we are but lowly unwashed musicians, unable to recognize their shrewd manipulative tactics, they assume that we will continue to entertain them long into the night, ignoring our own contract. This doesn't even take into account the contract of the catering hall and the dozens of their employees desperately trying to clean and clear the room so that they can punch out and get home to their own miserable lives. These chants for encores take place under the watchful eye of the dagger-throwing stare of the toupee maitre d' who's giving us the finger across the throat symbol. All of the contracts in the building at these functions contain provisions for overtime to be purchased in half-hour increments. This includes the band, the sound system, the lights, the food, the wait staff, and the hall itself. All someone needs to do to continue a party that is proceeding amazingly is to agree to write a check. A thumbs up from whomever is the benefactor or sponsor of the festivities can indeed extend the celebration in 30 minute blocks well into the wee hours. Money changes everything. As you can imagine, these extensions do happen, but seldom. Often this requires the band to pack our gear in the midst of an angry, drunken mob with varying levels of belligerence. The good feeling of receiving the rock star adulation turns ugly very quickly. The amount of time one is able to enjoy this adoration of the fans is roughly about 10 to 15 seconds. That's about the amount of time it takes for the cheers and applause to turn into chance for an encore, triggering the train, chain of events detailed above. When the extension generally doesn't materialize, nor does any explanation from the hosts, the cheers turn quickly to jeers, chiding the band for being party poopers. So yes, for those fleeting seconds, I am indeed a rock star. Writing a book is the adventure of a lifetime. Red Penguin Books take pride in giving our authors a publishing experience that is stress-free and celebratory all the way. Some of our authors first approach us with no more than an idea for a book that's ready to sprout. Others submit completed manuscripts. Whether you're at either end or anywhere in between, our goal is to get you published. At Red Penguin Books, we offer options and opportunities that are unique in the world of publishing, and all of them are designed to keep you, the author we so deeply respect, in the driver's seat, unlike other publishing houses. So, if you want to write a book and are looking for a publisher, we've got you covered. Red Penguin Books deal in publishing services, book development, and ghostwriting for digital, print, and audiobook. Call us at 516-448-448. 4993 or visit our website www.redpenguinbooks.com The fences have been mended the dishes put away Good, the work was hard, and not the end of day. I'm sitting on my porch front, I've had a glass or two. The sun is sinking one more time, got nothing else to do. Let's take it slow, let's take it easy. 
Let's take it easy 
Come meet me in the backyard Where I'll be painting pictures of my life I'll be drawing ones of gates and arcs Little doorways to the other side Where the poets of starving hearts And nobody's just in it for the ride I'll be painting pictures of my life I'll be drawing ones of kings and queens Ones of Cinderella and Joan of Arc Oh, where did it all go wrong? This story isn't the same old song Pulmonary Wellness Foundation, Good Talk TV sponsor. Please visit pulmonarywellness.com to learn more about this incredible organization. Today we have with us Long Island-based singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, 
former bandmate from way, way back in the day, an all-around great guy, Dave Diamond. Hey, Dave, thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. It's been a long time. It's a pleasure, man. How have you been? I've been uh, been okay in these weird, weird times. In these weird COVID times, right? Yes. Hard times for everybody. I would say especially hard for being a, a working musician, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah, something I've never experienced in my life, and we're trying to do what we can do when we can do it. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. You're taking uh, apples and making applesauce. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Something like that. I mean, I mean, some people like apples. I like both. So let me ask you this. Let's jump right in. You've been playing music for years, years, and years. Now I'm not dating you or nothing like that. Just club dates. But uh, say, let's take us back and tell us how it all began. How you. it all began. Yeah. The whole thing? Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> I mean, the condensed Reader's Digest version. The audience can sink their teeth into what started Dave Diamond, a young Dave Diamond playing. Uh, well, you know, I started, uh, on the drums, having two older brothers playing music and, um, they'd have the crappy <laughs> kits and I'd play them and break them because the, the drum heads were paper thin. So my brothers would be like, Dave broke the drums again. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so finally they got me a real kit. Uh, I burned my arm real good. Oh, wow. So, um, Never knew that. they brought me to the doctor and the doctor said, uh, you know, he's playing drums and the encouraged me because while my arm was healing the motion was good for the skin while it was re you know growing oh that makes sense so uh so my parents were super you know encouraging and i mean they they would have been either way uh and then from there having older brothers who played just wanted to play music i had friends that wanted to play we had a band starting in like fourth fifth grade oh and, wow so you then, really started early yeah yeah i knew what i wanted to do i i would when i was little like I want to be a magician when I grow up. My dad would be like, musician, musician. <laughs> oh, that's cute as hell. And uh, you grew up, you're from Long Island? Yes, yes, in Beth Page. Beth Page, that's New York. We have fans all over the world watching. Tell them all the instruments you play, because you are, when I said, both the instrumentalists. I wasn't lying. Uh, drums, guitars, bass, uh, piano, um, and sing. No woodwinds. That's my thing. I wish I played some sax or no sax. You dabble with the mandolin, old string. Uh, mandolin, yeah, mando, yep. That's the newest one. Oh yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people nowadays, I guess it's in fashion now. They play with that youth. Everyone's breaking out the ukule ukulele. Yeah, I've been messing with that too. It, it's fun, and my kid plays one, so it's it's fun. That's super cool. What would you say uh, your genre, your style of music, would categorize you if you wanted to try to categorize yourself? Um, I would say like where I wound up is like funky Americana funky. because, you know, cause I love, you know, I mean, I grew up on the Beatles and uh, the list is ridiculous what I like, but you know, I just, it's kind of all encompassing, but I, I'm a drummer first. So everything is gotta have a groove. Even the slowest ballad has gotta have a, some kind of groove. Yeah. In this studio, usually if I'm cutting everything myself, it's usually acoustic scratch vocal to a click and then you just build from there and then right. you do the acoustic and the vocal that is pretty cool so americana roots uh funky americana yeah yeah that's where i wound up i like that and you've been in tons of different bands throughout the years yes tours yeah. traveling around uh what's yeah. the, the latest bands that you're working with now uh well uh the last shows I did were in March of, uh, I guess, March of 2020, right? Yeah, March of 2020, yeah. Yeah. Uh, out in California uh, with a band called, it's the lead singer, Reed Janauer, from a band called Assembly of Dust. Okay. Uh, jam band, but Reed is an awesome singer, songwriter. So we did some shows at Phil Lesh's place, um, Terrapin Crossroads, mm. two nights, had some great guests, got to play with uh, Bonnie Raitt's bass player. Oh, wow. Great. Uh, uh, and uh, a couple other folks came out. Uh, Phil's son, Graham. Um, and so that was the last shows I did. And that was the last band I've been touring with. And then my band. The Dave Diamond I, Band, right? Dave Diamond Band and a host of, um, uh, I guess, a couple other things where it's Friends of the Brothers, some guys who plays with the Allman Brothers, uh, Junior Mack, Andy Allidort, um, Zen Tricksters do one or two dates a year because 
some of the guys are so busy with the other band, Dark Star Orchestra. So, we'll be so you keep very, very busy. Where could people find you? If they wanted to dig in and start looking up Dave Diamond and see your music, what, what's like social media sites can they visit to see you? Uh, well, my website is like the, it's got everything, davediamondmusic.com. It's got it all like, you know, where I'm at, where my band is at. Uh, then there's a Facebook page, uh, you know, Dave Diamond Band, uh, Facebook world. Okay. And uh, Instagram and all that. I think that's awesome. I want to leave you with one last question before we go, and then we're going to show one of your videos. Um, if somebody found a, a body of your work many years after you're gone, way in the future, and they're listening, what would you want them to take from it? Who was Dave Diamond? What does your music represent? What would you like them to learn from it? Um, in, uh, ooh, nice one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I would think that, I mean, a lot of my songs deal with, you know, just like introspective, you know, and like, you know, just um belonging you know okay. and you know you are not alone oh i like that and um but then again i wrote a, a song recently about my neighbor's dog so okay so uh a man of many seasons <laughs> yeah yeah and reasons. <laughs> and reasons and reasons and reasons belonging i think that's really cool and now what we're going to show them is a song entitled let me down. This is awesome. It was great to reconnect after all these years. I haven't seen you in years and years. I know, man. It's really, it was a great surprise to hear from you. Very, very cool. We're going to throw it in his video right now. And guys, you're in for a real treat. Have a good one, Dave. Take care. You too, brother. Front door. 